American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello and welcome to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. If you like American Catholic History, please help others find it by sharing this episode and giving us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noel Heisterfro. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about the most decorated military chaplain in U.S. history, the great Father Francis Duffy. The subtitle of this episode could be, Who's that Catholic priest statue in Times Square? I know, right? It's something of a whiplash moment, but there he is. Anyone who's been to Times Square over the past 20 or so years knows how just out of place that sounds. Times Square is a virtual cathedral to consumerism. Nearly every square inch of the buildings along that long diagonal intersection is covered by illuminated signage, most of it either flashing or animated in some way. It's all so bright that even during the day, the artificial lights illuminate things beyond just what the sun does. The place should really come with a warning label. Yeah. And that's not even to mention the craziness of New Year's Eve, the largest and most famous annual party on earth. Hundreds of thousands throng into Times Square to ring in the new year and watch the ball drop at the south end of the square. But at the northern end of Times Square, in a portion called Duffy Square, a 17-foot tall monument with an 8-foot tall statue of a Catholic priest has stood since 1937. That priest is Father Francis Francis Duffy. In the statue's depiction, he is wearing the leggings and long coat of a World War I officer, but instead of a rifle in his hands, he holds a Bible. His eyes look forward, and his face has a resolute and serene look. It's a fitting tribute to a really great man. But how great a man was he that he got such a monument just five years after his death? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. And in some ways, he was a man ahead of his time, like setting up a nursery in his parish. But in many more ways, he was a man made for his time. Honestly, he reminds me of what the playwright Robert Bolt said of St. Thomas More. He was a man for all seasons. No matter the challenge he faced or the setting he was in, he excelled. Whether as founding pastor of a parish in the Bronx, as a seminary theology professor and renowned moral theologian, or as a military chaplain in the toughest battles of World War I, Father Duffy had the energy, the vision, the love, and the can-do attitude to take it on and succeed. All right, so let's get to his history. Father Francis Duffy was born on May 2nd, 1871 in Coburg, Ontario, Canada. He was one of 11 children born to his Irish immigrant parents. His parents, it seemed, came over from Ireland as children when their parents were fleeing the Great Potato Famine. He was, by some accounts, a frail child with ill health, though you wouldn't have known that by his achievements later in life. It's a theme. Yeah. <laughs> he went to Catholic schools in Canada, including St. Michael's College in Toronto, before coming to New York City for graduate studies and to teach. It was while in New York that he heard the call to the priesthood, so he entered seminary for the Archdiocese of New York. He was ordained in 1896 and then was sent back to St. Joseph Seminary in Dunwoody up in Yonkers, New York, to teach philosophy of the human person. While in this role, he also became editor of the scholarly Catholic journal, The New York Review. The Review was the first real scholarly journal produced in America. We previously discussed Orestes Bronson in episodes 114 and 115. He was the first American Catholic to really gain international fame as a Catholic thinker on his own merits. But The Review was the first American journal to collect and publish articles by many different major thinkers who were wrestling with the major questions of the day and adopting the latest trends in biblical scholarship. These advances excited some, but alarmed others, particularly among the U.S. bishops. And this included New York's Archbishop, Michael Corrigan, whom we talked about a bit when we talked about Francis Xavier Cabrini in episode 120. Archbishop Corrigan was the one who gave her a cold welcome when she came over from Italy, before eventually becoming one of her biggest supporters. In the case of the New York Review, however, the reception didn't improve. The faculty responsible for the review was broken up. Father Duffy was sent to the Bronx to be the founding pastor of Our Savior Parish. 
But his time at Dunwoody had two other important elements. First, he was a beloved professor, advisor, and mentor. One student called him an Irish Socrates because his teaching style included a good deal of probing questioning rather than just lecture. He wanted the students to reason out the matter at hand and not just listen to him lecture about it. As the best philosophy professors will do because philosophy is an exercise of the mind, not just a list of facts to be re repeated. Mm -hmm, exactly. And secondly, he he volunteered to be a military chaplain to the New York National Guard. As a chaplain, he was assigned to the New York 69th Regiment, the <laughs> Irish Brigade, the fighting force that had been called the Fighting Irish and the Fighting 69th since the American Civil War. In 1898, the 69th was deployed to fight in the Spanish-American War, where they patrolled towns along the border with Mexico to prevent Mexican incursions. And while there, I'll bet more than a few of the troops of the Irish Brigade took advantage of the canteens and the huts that the Knights of Columbus invaded during the Spanish-American War. I'd imagine so. Folks should really listen to episode 70 for more on what the Knights of Columbus and their Casey's did for our troops during wartime. It's so cool. Yeah. So yeah, Father Duffy went to the Mexican border with the 69th, and as the men contracted various diseases, he took part in nursing them. Eventually, he contracted typhoid and was sent back to Dunwoody to recuperate. But in 1912, he left Dunwoody for his nation parish in the Bronx. At the time, this parish was little more than a converted storefront. The parishioners were not enthusiastic, but Father Duffy poured himself into it, and within a few years he had built a building that housed both a church and a school, an innovative idea at the time, for the parish. Our Savior Parish thrived under his pastorate. However, his time there wouldn't last forever. World War I broke out in August 1914, and the Fighting 69th pretty much knew their time was going to come. Sure enough, when the U.S. declared war on Germany and the Central Powers in 1917, the New York 69th was federalized and renamed the 165th Regiment and was placed in the 42nd Rainbow Division of the U.S. Army. Recruitment of new troops to swell the ranks began in earnest, and the 69th was choosy. Unlike most units, the 69th had very specific requirements for physical fitness and toughness. They rejected many men who were too thin or had some physical impairment like flat feet. A number of those men were snapped up by other units who were not nearly so choosy. But apart from being choosy about who got in, the other thing that really characterized the 69th was the Irish Catholic ethos. They didn't outright reject non-Irish and non-Catholic recruits, but they didn't go out seeking them either, and anyone they admitted had to be on board with the fighting Irish being the dominant ethos of the regiment. If you were committed to fighting hard and being a loyal man of the 69th, well then, by God, you were Irish enough. Uh, as for the question of religion, well, not every regiment had a Catholic chaplain, so Father Duffy and others pushed the army to send the Catholics into those regiments like the 69th that did have their own Catholic chaplain. The chaplains knew well that the young men in uniform, if not provided for spiritually, ran a real risk of losing their faith when faced with the crucible of war. At the outset of the war, the Fighting 69th was better than 80% Irish by birth or heritage, and nearly all Catholic. Those numbers both dipped as the war raged and casualties mounted, but replacements held the legend of the Fighting 69th in high esteem and were eager to adopt that ethos and live up to it. In fact, it seemed that the fighting spirit and the Irishness was greater among the non-Irish, non-Catholic members of the 69th because they were so inspired by the acceptance and esprit de corps that they found in that regiment. And Father Duffy was a major part of sustaining that esprit de corps during the war. Another prominent member of the Fighting 69th, one who was not Irish at all, but like to say he was, the recent Catholic convert poet Joyce Kilmer. We told his epic story in episode 46. He became a good friend of Father Duffy, and Duffy appreciated that another well-known intellectual was part of the 69th. The Fighting 69th arrived in France in November 1917. They saw their first action in February 1918 at Rouge Bouquet. Joyce Kilmer actually wrote a poem called Rouge Bouquet about a group of 22 soldiers who were killed when their dugout suffered a direct hit from a German artillery shell. These were among the first of many casualties the 69th suffered. And from Rouge Bouquet through Champagne to Chateau Thierry, where Sergeant Joyce Kilmer was killed by a sniper while on a reconnaissance mission, through Samuel, and finally at Meuse-Argonne. The 69th was tasked with some of the hardest fighting of the war. 
but the Fighting Irish Regiment was known for its tenacity and for always being ready for a fight. At one point, when Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur, who was commander of the 83rd Brigade, was looking to press ahead, every other regiment responded that they were too fatigued, but the 69th replied that they would consider an order to advance as a compliment. MacArthur exclaimed, By God, it takes the Irish when you want a hard thing done. <laughs> and Father Duffy was the heart and soul of that regiment. He heard confessions often. His confession line was often longer than the Chow line. One soldier, after an intense confession, said to his commander, you can put my name down for any old job out there. I'm all cleaned up and I don't give a damn what happens now. He offered mass. He went to hospitals and gave the last rites. He never shied from joining the men in the trenches and going with the litter bearers to bring the wounded back from the front. He regularly braved enemy fire to anoint the wounded and dying. A reporter who saw him during his time downrange wrote that he could be seen covered with mud and grime in the thick of the fighting, cheering on the living, administering the last rites of his church to the dying, filling the place of a stretcher bearer who had been struck down by a bullet, assisting the wounded, darting hither and yon, a ministering angel. For 117 hours, he was under fire without rest. Another chaplain, a non-Catholic, wrote of him, There was something in the manner of the man that bespoke his religious conviction. There was something in his frank smile and in his serenity that made one feel he would undergo any dangers, endure any hardships, give his life if he could be of service. Back in the camp, he was a leader in maintaining high spirits and keeping the men's minds and hearts focused on their tasks. And these are the sorts of things that made him stand out and made him absolutely beloved among his men. Those men would have run through a brick wall for him. He was their father, their confidant, their friend, and he went where they went and suffered what they suffered. But he brought the light and joy of Christ with him wherever he went. This isn't to say he wasn't affected by the thousands of dying and wounded around him. After the battle at Ork, where Sergeant Kilmer was among those killed, Father Duffy wrote, I knew these men so well and loved them as if they were my younger brothers. It has been the saddest day of my life. Well, it is the last act of love I can do for them and for the folks at home. In the midst of one battle, he actually turned over a soldier who was badly wounded and lay dying. But before he could give the last rites, he broke down in tears. He had baptized that soldier as a boy back in New York. But in spite of his own personal heartache, he quitted himself so well that the higher ups in the 42nd, including Douglas MacArthur, who was division chief of staff at the time, considered making Duffy the regimental commander of the 69th, an unprecedented notion for a chaplain. Fortunately, the 69th had an excellent commander, William Wild Bill Donovan, so this suggestion never made it too far, but it was considered. The war ended on November 11th, 1918. The Fighting 69th had fought for just 164 days, but had suffered 844 dead and 2,387 wounded. After the war, the 69th and Father Duffy remained in Europe as part of the Army of Occupation, returning to New York in April of 1919. When time came to board ships and return to New York, Father Duffy wrote, but I could think of nothing except the fine lads who had come out with us to this war and who are not alive to enjoy the triumph. All day I had a lonely and aching heart. Upon his return, he was revered and feted, though he wanted none of it. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and the Distinguished Service Medal, as well as the Conspicuous Service Cross from the New York National Guard. From France, he was awarded the Légion d'Honneur and the Croix de Guerre. In addition to the Grand Parade in honor of the Fighting 69th, Father Duffy was compelled, again against his preference, to participate in a number of events to honor him in particular. He had become known across the country due to the reports of his gallantry and his selfless and tireless service to the men. Back in New York, he simply wanted to go back to being a parish priest, and he did. He was appointed pastor of Holy Cross Church on West 42nd Street, a few blocks from Times Square. As was his wont, he spent a good deal of time getting to know the people of New York in and around his parish, and they got to know him and love him. He was a friend of the laborers of the nearby theater district, of the market workers, of stevedores, and of everyone who needed a friend. Out of concern for those workers nearby whose work schedules made regular Sunday Mass attendance difficult, he sought and received permission from the Vatican to offer a Mass at 2.15 a.m. on Sundays. One who knew him wrote of him during his time at Holy Cross, This city is too large for most of us, but not for Father Duffy. 
not too large, I mean, for him to invest it with the homeliness of a neighborhood. When he walked down the street, any street, he was like a curé striding through his own village. Everybody knew him. For himself, Father Duffy said his secret was simple, being fond of people, just people. Just beautiful. (laughs) His time after the war was also occupied by two writing projects. The first was a history of the Fighting 69th Regiment. The manuscript for this book was actually started by Joyce Kilmer during the war. Father Duffy had taken up the task to complete it after Kilmer's untimely death. But when Father Duffy took over the project, others convinced him to turn it into his own reminiscences rather than a strict history of the 69th. The eventual book was published as Father Duffy's Story. The other writing project was an article for the Atlantic Monthly. In 1927, the governor of New York, the Catholic Al Smith, we haven't told his story yet, but it'll come up one day, was running for president, and he was attacked for his Catholic faith. One prominent Protestant lawyer wrote a long article in the Atlantic Monthly arguing that a Catholic could not be a good patriotic American because Catholics have too much allegiance to the Pope. I've heard that argument a lot. Clearly, he hadn't read his Orestes Brownson. Clearly. Yeah. Father Duffy Ghost wrote a response for Smith, and in it, he laid out a clear defense of Catholic patriotism. It's a tour de force of political and American thinking, and it includes arguments about conscience rights and religious freedom that would eventually be fleshed out and included in the Vatican II document on religious freedom, Dignitates Humanae. Father Francis Duffy died of colitis on June 27, 1932. 25,000 turned out for his funeral at St. Patrick Cathedral and to line the route from Holy Cross to the cathedral and then to accompany the body to the cemetery in the Bronx. He was buried with full military honors and his burial was even saluted by a flyover of military planes. Pretty amazing in 1932. Seriously. (laughs) But perhaps the best tribute to the man came in an exchange between a police officer and a woman who was trying to push past the barricades for a better view of the funeral. The officer stopped her, and when she protested that she was a friend of the deceased, the officer replied, That can be said, ma'am, of everyone here today. It took no time at all for the people of New York to begin planning the monument in Father Duffy's honor. Within one year, a committee formed to erect a monument. Just five years later, in 1937, the statue was dedicated by the mayor of New York, Fiorello LaGuardia. And two years later, the northern portion of Times Square, between 46th and 47th Streets, where the statue stands, was officially named Duffy Square. Ever since, Father Duffy, the man of action, erudition, and grace, has watched over the city and the neighborhood that he loved and served so well. You've been listening to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help others find it by sharing this episode and by giving us a five-star rating and a good review. Be sure to check out our sponsor, Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. Also, please support the many fine productions of SQPN at sqpn.com slash give. And be sure to sign up for our new newsletter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. To learn more about Father Francis Duffy, to find previous episodes, or to learn about our upcoming pilgrimages to important and unforgettable Catholic holy sites, please visit AmericanCatholicHistory.org. We also love feedback and hearing about great Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH 1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media and produced by StarQuest.